I'm Glenn McGuinness, and this is Outburst. On the program, will Pierre Polyev be an effective leader for the Conservative Party of Canada? I'm not a fan of his. He seems like a really strong leader. He knows what he's talking about. I think he's going to have a hard time bringing the party together. I hope he can. There are things that Mr. Polyev believes that I don't disagree with. As Pierre Polyev's tenure began as Conservative Party leader and leader of the official opposition when Parliament resumed a few weeks back, it followed an exhaustive search by the Conservatives to find a leader who could unite that party across the country and bring them back to the promised land. But since the Harper era ended back in 2015 and in the ensuing elections that followed since then, the Conservative Party of Canada had two leaders and two interim leaders leading up to the election of Polyev. So, well, he proved to be the solution that party needs for success in the future. Our question. Will Pierre Polyev be an effective leader for the Conservative Party of Canada? Ha, I love this one. <laughs> it's unlikely. <laughs> the, the, the PC party just hasn't seemed to be able to get it together in the last while, and he's pretty far on the right side, so I think he's going to have a hard time bringing the party together. I hope he can, uh, so that there's some degree of competition in the country, because right now there's none. I've bled blue all my life, have voted uh, up until the last election for the PC party, was not impressed last election with the PC party, so I decided to go red. My father turned in his grave, I am sure, and now I am definitely undecided, but I'm still, uh, Pierre is not doing it for me, so I think we got a lot more to learn from him, and so far it's, uh, it's a slippery slope for me. Yes, he will be. He will be. I'm number one with that guy. I should. That's why I'm wearing blue too. But um, no, I agree with everything that he's saying for the changes for Canada for the better. And I don't agree with the with the, the Trudeau tax, as like as he puts it. So I feel that you know, with with new fresh face, new fresh face stepping in, and hope, hopefully with the inflation rates, he's going to bring things down and make Canada what it was before the pandemic started. There are things that. Mr. Polyev believes that I don't disagree with. I personally wouldn't consider myself a conservative, but we all want faster airports. You know what I mean? We all want to be able to get to the places that we want to go quicker. So public transit needs to be improved. But I don't think that you can have good policies and have those same policies wrapped in xenophobia and racism, and I'm going to vote for you. So he might be a good leader for whatever it is that the Conservative Party wants to become in the future, but that's not my party, and that's not a party that I would vote for. I think he will be. So far, I'm liking his platform and what has already changed since he's become the leader. So I'm thinking this is going to be a good thing. It's a little too early to see exactly how it's going to affect us, but I think it's going to be a good thing. I can't do any worse than his previous uh, candidate, so I uh, yeah I like the way uh, I like the way he, he, he takes on a challenge with the with, with the Liberals. Uh, he's a bit of a fighter, I think. So I think I, I think he'll be a good candidate. I think he would for that party. Whether he becomes prime minister or not is another thing, but I think he would be an effective leader for that party. He, um, he certainly uh, can pull a message together. He's certainly able to drive uh, an agenda and uh, galvanize his party. Uh, I think he won, what, 70% of the vote? So uh, he seems to be an effective um, person for that. When it comes to persuading the country and running the country, I think there's a lot more to be seen. <laughs> he might be. Uh, I might be the wrong person to ask. I've only moved back to Canada a couple of years ago, so uh, certainly there's a lot of negative portrayal of him in terms of uh, equating him to Trump and all the rest of it. And I came from the States uh, for the last 20 years, so I don't want anything near that happening here. <laughs> but to be honest, I don't know enough about Pierre to truly have a, 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 a well-rounded answer for that one. I'm not a fan of his. Um, I'm not really a fan of any leader at the moment, but I'm definitely he's at the bottom of my list right now, for sure. And just from things I've looked, just what I've looked at his past, I'm not huge on career politicians anyways, but yes. Now, my I know family that really supports him. Um, not in our home, but <laughs> there's families that support him. I'm not generally a PC person, so yeah. Uh, Got to be po politically correct, I guess. <laughs> PC for the PCs, absolutely not. No. He goes in and he represents a fringe base which is he's basically picking up on the Trump leftovers, uh, the QAnon, you know, he's basically hidden that group, the PPC group, which 
seem to support him more. He is creating unity through division. He's creating unity on one side by prying those levers farther and farther apart. So effective in terms of whipping people into an angry frenzy and getting them all to march in the same direction? Sure. But I think leadership, especially in Canada, needs to be about um, doing the right thing for people even if they don't align with your values. Being a leader for all Canadians, not just your base. And I think he is not going to be effective at that. And he has proven for his entire career that he's not effective at that. So, um, again, it depends how you define leadership. But the way I define leadership, no, he's not going to be an effective leader. You know, I think that uh, Polyev, he excels at fomenting fear, anger and unrest. Um, I think if that is what the foundation of the Conservative Party in Canada has become, then yes, he absolutely will. Um, I like to think, however, that as one of our two um, fundamental parties in Canada, he needs to speak to people beyond um, his small core of supporters. And I don't see any evidence of him uh, respecting the rest of Canada and being um, an effective leader for people who don't necessarily agree with absolutely everything he, he says and believes in. So, no, I don't think that he will be an effective leader. It just doesn't have, I don't think he has the demeanor for it. He seems to be a smart man, but he just doesn't, doesn't seem to be applying that intelligence to where it really matters. It's just cause de jour, you know, and, and um, I haven't heard anything come out of him yet that it's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I am optimistic that it'll be better than the current situation. Um, I think it's, we'll just have to wait and see. Everyone always has a lot more promises than what they actually do. So yeah, waiting game. <laughs> uh, from my knowledge and what I've seen, like I haven't looked into it much, but he seems like a really strong leader. He knows what he's talking about and isn't afraid to like say something that's going to cause like opposition and uproar. So he seems like a strong leader and what Conservative Party might need. More than two and a half years into the pandemic, we can draw a stark contrast to the way things were, say, back in the spring of 2020. Lockdowns have been lifted. More Canadians are vaccinated. Crowds can gather once again, and travel restrictions have been eased. With all these factors in play, one could think we're nearing the end of this, and things will be as they were before. Recently, U.S. President Joe Biden exclaimed the pandemic was over in his country, which did raise a few eyebrows. But here in Canada, we continue to grapple with the pandemic in our healthcare system as hospitalizations continue to rise. So we took to the streets to ask people where they think we sit with the pandemic these days. Our question. Do you feel the worst of the pandemic is over? Yes and no. Um, yes, in that, I mean, we have countermeasures, we have, uh, we have vaccines, we have an awareness more publicly in general of um, how to behave. But no, because not a lot of people are doing it. We have very low vaccine uptake. Um, and people are relaxing back to as if the before times, as if it never happened. So we haven't learned and evolved from the pandemic. The uh, HVAC systems and whatnot have not been universally changed, which was a simple no brainer that would help with all sorts of sicknesses and illnesses. No, it's just wait, maybe it'll end. And that's sort of what happened. So I think the biggest hump is over, but we're, we are so not done. And the idea that we are done is what's gonna, I hope I'm wrong, but is probably what's gonna bite us the hardest. I do, I do, uh, partly because I'm an optimistic person and I think uh, worst time is now behind us. I think um, globally speaking, the international community and then international society, I would call it, are actually looking um, at, the, at the future with cautious optimism because uh, in as much as we dealt, I think we have dealt with the pandemic effectively, we should also be cautious of uh, the emergence of any other you know, challenges, global challenges be it a new pandemic or be it a new challenge. But I think I think uh, the worst part of COVID-19 
per se and specifically is actually over? Yeah, I think so. Most of it. Um, I think for the winter, we're going to have to wear masks on buses and wash our hands. But um, I think the, the worst of it's over. Yes, I do. Ah, pretty well, uh, from what we can tell by the numbers are down there. People are feeling better. Less people that I know personally are, are getting sick. Uh, yes, the flu bug is coming back there, but it's to differentiate between the flu and uh, the coronavirus there. But hey, it, it has to come around. It's not going to totally disappear. I think that a lot of people have less mental health issues now that they're back like at school and at work and just like in society. So I think that a lot of what I personally saw, like which was like, I guess kind of the mental health aspect of it has kind of, it's, it feels like we're coming out of the dark. At least I would in. say yes, the worst of it is over. I feel like it's become more normalized now. Um, there's not as many restrictions and things are easing up, which makes it a lot more easier to live our lives, going back to some normalcy. Um, and I also feel like the new variants aren't as severe, so there's not as many hospitalizations and stress on our healthcare system. So yes, I would say, you know, pandemic is eased up and we're getting back to normal. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people have lost the fear that they originally had, which makes it feel like it's not here. I feel the worst is over now, as far as the government's let us know for sure, just because of all the mandates being lifted. And also because everyone has the vaccine has been has been done as well. So it's kind of gives us more, you know, confidence to go out and do things like we normally would like today at the farmer's market. Concerts are going on now. So we're hoping that the worst is over. We never know really what's going on. But from the numbers that we've seen lately, there hasn't really been anything. The kids are back in school. So I hope I hope it's the worst is over for now. Yeah. I think the worst of it's over um, because there's less virus circulating. People understand the science better. There's just a better understanding of the whole thing. We have hope so. That's, I mean, yes, I think I'm, it is. I'm thinking the worst is over, but there's still, you still have to be careful. There's still viruses going around as there would be with any flu virus. So you got to be careful still. And I don't wear masks anymore. I think from a, from a policy standpoint that um, the worst the worst of the restrictions are, are hopefully over. Hopefully we don't see uh, a return to almost uh, de facto martial law kind of uh, situation. Um, but um, is, is it better like, uh, like the disease itself? Uh, I, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I mean, it seems like there's new variants coming out uh, almost every day and no one really knows for sure how severe they are. Uh, it takes time to, to tell the severity of things. Possibly. <laughs> I kind of mixed on it. Yeah. Um, I know that it's an end endemic right now, but that doesn't mean it's over. But he does a lot of, he looks up a lot, so. Based on the existing science right now, this will most likely keep going until the strain goes and kills itself out. And that's about it. But there's always a possibility that it could get worse. Which of the following prime ministers never had a majority government? Lester B. Pearson, Brian Mulroney, or Stephen Harper? Uh, Lester B. Pearson. Brian Mulroney. I don't know. Uh, Mulroney. I'm going to say Pearson. Harper? Is it Harper? Lester B. Pearson. Yeah, I was gonna say the same. It is Lester B. Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> High five each other, you're good. We're nerd, we're political nerds. Don't, don't spill your coffee. I know. <laughs> Lester B. Pearson was the federal Liberal Party leader for 10 years, between 1958 and 1968. Pearson steered his party through four elections in total. He lost the first two to John Diefenbaker's Progressive Conservatives in 1958 and in 1962, and won in the 1963 and 1965 general elections with a minority government both times. While his government never achieved majority status in the House of Commons, Pearson's accomplishments include introducing the Order of Canada and the Canada Pension Plan, as well as a new and distinctive Canadian flag.
These are challenging economic times we live in. High inflation rates have forced Canadians to dig deeper to pay more for everyday essentials. And to combat high inflation, the Bank of Canada raised interest rates by 75 basis points to 3.25% in September. And more interest rate hikes could follow. Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland warned that Canadians can expect an economic slowdown in the coming months. It will cost Canadians more to borrow and for many to maintain their mortgage. So we took to the streets to ask people how this will affect them. Our question. What impact will higher interest rates have on you? Well, for me as an immigrant, it's really hard thinking about getting uh, buying a house just because of the fact that I'm new in this country. So it's it's very hard. And now it's a little bit more hard, you know, like it's not on my plans. Uh, actually, I, I didn't even think about it because I know it's going to be really hard to get a house in here. Well, for most people, high interest rates, uh, you know, are really going to slow things down, especially for somebody looking to buy a home. Uh, mortgage rates are going to be higher. Uh, if you go to buy a car, it's going to cost you more money. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that everybody's going to feel, I'm sure. Uh, it'll be positive because I'm not a borrower. I'm a, I'm a saver, I'm a creditor. So higher interest rates are good for me. But I also understand that higher interest rate reflect inflation, so one offsets the other. All in all, inflation is negative, it's bad. And the Bank of Canada shouldn't have got us into the position that we're in now. Um, I can't afford life, basically. It's been like hard with credit cards and I'm a student, so my tuition is higher and everything like that. Student loans. Yeah, student loans bad yeah to be honest i yeah it, it has a big impact especially since i'm a student and i'm looking into potentially buying a house in the future taking out loans for for different things um i'm i'm not too financially literate to be honest with you but um it's definitely a, a worry for a person trying to get into the into the real world who has to kind of worry about money you know, I, 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 as a Canadian, I don't think there's anyone who isn't affected. And um, it's, it is making life just that much more challenging. And yet I can also appreciate why the interest rates are increasing. And it's probably the right move. Um, but it is challenging for a lot of people. I do believe that, for example, right now I'm trying to find a mortgage for myself and uh, you know have my own house. So a higher interest rate is actually uh, precluding me from buying a new house, um, as well as it makes um, you know you know finding job and a little bit difficult, especially with the you know an increase in interest rate makes it difficult for the economy and the economy uh, the deterioration here of the economy makes it also challenging for employees people future job seekers like myself as i'm trying to wrap up my phd and then go into the job market make it a little bit difficult for me as well and uh, yeah i am yet to see the real challenge for me as i have not finished my phd yet but i think it uh, an increase of interest rate might will make it uh, difficult for income for affordable housing and also for you know standards of living in general on me uh, not really <laughs> i i don't have any major debt just the monthly credit card statement and that's pretty nominal so it's not a big issue they were warning us before the pandemic canadians reduce your debt reduce your debt and i hope people did but i see all the debt signs on buses if you got debt, la la la, everywhere. So I'm guessing probably not. I think my biggest concern right now is after graduating and then trying to buy a home. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> As of right now, I know like a lot of my peers, we've talked about it before and a lot of us are worried if we'll ever be able to own our own home. So, well, in regards to student loans, that's gonna be really bad. Like really, really bad. Um, that could put me back in like housing and like if I want to move that kind of stuff, it's going to follow me everywhere. Um, just kind of getting off my feet and out of school is going to be a lot harder to like make a profit from my career. So, uh, <laughs> well, I think for everybody, it's not good to have higher rates because then we have to pay more 
and the salaries are all the same. So if they put the salaries a little bit higher, then it'd be easier to do more payments. But at this time, uh, with the salaries at the same base and interest just going up, it's too much. It's too much for Canadians to, to bear, I think. But I, I see like as a, if you take it as a economical point of view, uh, I feel like it's, it's a good thing that they do right now. Uh, by increasing the rate, they're trying to control the inflation, uh, which I think is a it's a good thing. That is going to like impact in our long run. I think it's going to have a big effect on the economy. I feel yeah. bad for the young people who can't get into housing already with well, low income. interest rates. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, even if the house prices drop, the higher, st higher interest rates still makes it impossible for young people to you know, get into real estate. It, yeah, I think it's not going to be good, and I hope it doesn't last long. I hope the rates drop. And yeah. Well, we're not very happy about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, we're just we're you know, we're looking at all kinds of different areas of where the monthly spend is, and you know, uh, from housing to food costs, and why we want to support local markets, just like the one right right now, uh, are going to be important. But uh, you know. We're gonna, we're gonna, we have to watch. We gotta watch. It's gonna be a tough one, you know. Um, I still have a mortgage, and um, I gotta pay for it. But as a retired person, fixed income—that's on one hand—is kind of tough. But on the other hand, I don't have to spend too much. I don't need uh, work clothes anymore, and my—I don't use my car too much. Back around the end of 2020, when COVID-19 vaccines first became available, millions of Canadians lined up to get their shot in hopes of protecting themselves from the virus. Well, now more than two years later, the virus has changed as well as the vaccines. And many Canadians are now taking a more cavalier approach to getting their shot, with some opting out altogether. As hospitalizations continue to rise, federal and provincial governments are urging Canadians to get out and get vaccinated as the weather gets colder and respiratory illnesses are expected to become more prevalent. So will you be rolling up your sleeves once again, or will you be taking a pass this time around? Our question. Will you be getting another COVID-19 booster shot? I, I don't really have there's a four, I, I, I have three already. Um, I felt like that's enough. Um, the more I thought about it, I kind of took the vaccines just cause it was kind of, it was just to kind of get this pandemic to be over. Just kind of everyone as a unit getting the vaccine, we're all able to like get herd immunity, but I, I might be overkill getting the fourth one. I I feel like three is enough. I, 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 don't, I don't know. To be honest, yeah, I don't think I will. Yeah. Um, so I study like immunity um, as like for my second degree. So that's it's kind. Of, I think it's kind of necessary. Um, it's kind of almost just like it has to be like a flu shot, where it's definitely required that you educate your immune system to what's happening, or educate your immune system to like what antigens you could be presented with. Um, and if we don't actually keep our immune system educated, then we know what happens. Um, so it's just, it's best not to suffer from it. And, you know, luckily, like a lot of healthcare covers that. So we might as well, we have the resource, might as well not sleep on it. So I think so. Yeah. Um, just because my aunt was in the ICU on like her deathbed and I'm living with them. So honestly, just out of her protection, I would 100% get it. Yes. Uh, just because I still want to be able to visit my mother who's not in the best of shape right now. And that was part of her uh, criteria. She says, if you want to come and visit me, you'll go get your shot, but also too, to protect others around me. And I feel better about it. Probably, yeah. I already have three, so yeah. Why? Why? Uh, just, to, just to keep up, like I get a flu shot every year. So if it's, this, if it's a similar idea, then I definitely will. I do have the three, first one, and I will get the fourth one, yes. And why? Because I think it's a responsibility of everyone to protect itself or herself and to protect the society. Liberty ends when the liberty of someone else starts. So I cannot impose my, my view if someone else doesn't agree with me. So I will, be, I will be doing that, yeah. I am actually, yeah, I've had four 
and uh, I feel fairly secure. I was just reading apparently only one in four uh, people in Ottawa have had the fourth booster. If that's true, you know, and that's a little concerning. So, uh, I mean, they're free, they're available. And uh, I think everybody that can should make an effort to, to, to get to a pharmacy or wherever the locations are to, uh, uh, you know, feel more secure about their situation with it. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to think about that for a while. I've had all the shots so far. I've had no reaction. Uh, they served me well. I haven't had any COVID. So I'll be leaning in that direction, more or less. Yes. And why is that? Um, I, I just think that the variants keep changing and we don't know what's coming and it's been five months since we've had our last booster so I just I feel better getting a booster. Yes I will. Yes another COVID-19 booster shot. Omicron variant specific. It's B1A and we're on B15 but we're slowly catching up so yes I will be doing that. Probably I might uh, consider that because I feel like the, the shots that we have got like I got three shots uh, as of now and I got an email for my next one as well so I feel it saved like uh, tons of lives uh, and in, it impacts because we live in a society right so there's no way that we could live on our own so uh, I feel like we need to be safe and it, it's science that you have to respect because we see all these things because of science and then people actually develop it so I feel like I should get it uh, and I don't see any harmful effects of uh, not, I would say, like, getting it. So um, I respect it and then I thank all the people like who developed it and then it, it's for our sake and then for our safe. No, I won't be. Just because um, I don't feel that I'm in a situation where I'm at harm, where I don't work with the elderly at all. Like, you know, people who work with the elderly are in a social setting, public setting, should maybe think about it. But if it's not going to affect who you're generally populated with, like, on a day-to-day -day -day social basis, I don't think you would need it if as long as you're you know healthy and you, you keep yourself rested and have lots of vitamins and eat eat right you should be okay once you've had the, like i've had two so you should be okay that's what i feel anyway so. thanks for watching this episode of outburst on cpac if you have any comments about this show or any other show you can find us on social media you can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca i'm glenn mcginnis and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.